hopefully somebody shows up tonight. <laughs> if not, I'll just be playing for myself, which is fine. <clears throat> but I am so tired. Uh, basically, well, for anybody watching this in future times or whatnot, um, or we have one person here. Hello, whoever you are. Um, Bob's Baharka, how's it going? Hello, Merry Christmas. Um, yeah, uh, today's a longer stream, and I apologize if, um, well, I don't have makeup on today and etc. because I literally flew in from Canada this morning. So I arrived uh, at Edinburgh Airport today at um, 6, 15 in the morning, came home, had a two hour nap, and then woke up around noon. Uh, and um, this is part of how I'm making myself stay awake tonight so that I can hopefully combat the jet lag. So yeah, I'm running on um, two and a half hours of sleep right now. So if I make any mistakes or if I look tired, that's why. <laughs> Um, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I was originally going to do this stream tomorrow, but I just, I have plans for New Year's. I assumed other people would have plans, which would, so I thought today would be more convenient for everyone. And yeah, it's going to be a big one. Um, a lot of my time over Christmas while I was at home was spent researching all my segments for this and then like writing them out and recording them and everything. So um yeah it's there's a lot to get through today because uh, we are building the pyramids at giza so it's quite fun like i'm excited to do this level i think it's going to take me flipping ages to do such so that's why we've got a bit of a longer stream today um it's going to lead into the premiere of a video um that's just kind of like a 2023 roundup of the channel um, I don't know if this is something that anyone else is going to be interested in. It's probably going to end up being like a 10 out of 10 on my like ranking of my last 10 videos, but I decided to make it anyway. Um, so it's just kind of talking about, you know, what were the things that I changed this year? What are some of the things I achieved? What are the, some of the things that I didn't achieve? And what are my goals for next year and the future of the channel going on? So it's just like 15 minutes long. Um, as per usual, if you are here, if you can subscribe, like, comment, do whatever you can to help support the channel, that's appreciated. Um, what we're doing today is I am playing the game Pharaoh, which is from like the early 2000s. It helped inspire my love of ancient Egypt and my desire to become an archaeologist. And so what we're doing basically, if you're new, we play through all, we're playing through all the levels of the game while also talking about all the history and the historical people and the places that inspired the game. Um, we are going to probably be playing for about two and a half hours today, um, so you're not obligated to stay for the whole thing. If you can, that would be cool. Um, yeah, uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm oh, sorry, I just, I got to get a blanket because also while I was gone, my boiler <laughs> broke or, or developed a leak so when we got home today um the house was quite chilly and it's still like warming up so it's only about like 16 degrees celsius right now in my office um anyway i'm gonna start at the end of the last mission we'll have our victory and then we'll proceed to the mission briefing which we'll kind of just listen to and then we'll have a look at the map the resources what are the things that we have at our disposal and then I will start playing a pre-recorded segment that I have that's pictures and audio um, that discover that cover the different aspects of the game. And then, of course, in between things, I will um, come into the chat. If anybody has any questions at any time, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, do whatever. And I also will be adding at some point references and image credits into the description of all the pictures that I'm using here today. I want to give proper credit to everyone. Um, if you've not uh, checked out my previous streams, you can find them on the playlist on the channel called Archaeologist Plays. And yeah, 
So last stream, we quarried some stone for Khufu um, and built some mastabas for his nobles at the level or the at the area of On, which is also known as Heliopolis. Um, so now we're moving on to the next level, which is building one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, Khufu's Great Pyramid at Giza. Um, uh, we will also be building today the Sphinx and Khafra's Pyramid. And since, yeah, I, I actually think it's quite serendipitous that we're playing this today and it's like the last one of the year and it's like the big one. So, um, Happy New Year to you too, Ivan. Um, the segments that we have for today are the Pyramid Kings, so little biographies of Khufu, Khafra, kind of Dejedfra, uh, and Mankara, who, um, Khufu, Khafra, and Mankara are the kings that built it, Giza. And then we'll talk a little bit about the site of Giza slash Rostja, as it's called in the game. Um, a little bit about its use, the different things we have there, but also about like its history and its history of excavation. Um, then we'll talk about the Great Pyramid, um, the uh, Khafra's Pyramid, the Sphinx, and then Mankara's pyra Pyramid complex. So yeah, lots and lots of stuff to cover today. So let's get started. Yeah. Right. Uh, proceed. Let's see if I can... Nope, I have to go to my last... Uh, on. Oh, that's great. Right, so we're done. Victory, great. I like to win. Splendid. The mines you established at Tura have burnished all the limestone that Khufu has required so far. With the strong economy based on the productive Tura mines, your city has reached new cultural and social heights. <sighs> Pharaoh Khufu has at last made his plans known, and his boundless aspirations are sure to weigh heavily upon our people. Pharaoh both curses and blesses your family. For though you have been awarded the status of Nomarch, you have also been charged with carrying out the most ambitious building project ever to be undertaken in our land. Pharaoh's eternal resting place shall be a massive pyramid complex situated far from any city on the plateau outside Rostja. His sarcophagus to be made of solid granite and his funeral barge of precious Lebanese cedar. Beside Pharaoh's pyramid complex, a smaller pyramid shall also be built for his son, Prince Khafra, whose tyranny rivals that of his father, though his achievements do not. Khafra also declares that his image be carved into the living rock at Rostja, upon a huge figure called a sphinx, with the body of a lion, and the head of a man. To support the massive building effort needed for the completion of this monument, you'll need to establish a large settlement at Rostja. As such, conditions there may not be overly refined, for your goal is only to complete these three great projects and to honor Piro. You will be provided with some of the fine white limestone needed for the outer casing of these pyramids. But you will also need to purchase much of what you need with the city's own funds. Pharaoh is entrusting you, one of his royal nomarchs, with these three sacred tasks. You must demonstrate unwavering dedication to Pharaoh and fulfill his wishes, whatever the cost. Da, da. Ominous. Right. So let's have a look at our map here. It's big. So we've got some ostriches. We've got some quarries for our stone. We have a Nile branch um, or Nile. We've got some farming strips and we've got a ton of land. <laughs> so I'm also, so be, while preparing my segments for today, I spent a lot of time looking at maps of Giza. So we are going to attempt to recreate, so to speak, the, um, 
rough layout of some of Giza. It's an, I, the settlement's not gonna be right, but in terms of like where the pyramids are and everything, I'm gonna try and get that close to what it is. So we've got a Sphinx, a pyramid complex, and a medium pyramid. So yeah, we'll have to do some creative stuff with some causeways here, but that's fine. Um, let's see, raw materials, plain stone, gemstones. So, so that's gonna be my cash cow there is my gemstone mine. Um, my temple to Ra, temple to Ta. Ta is my major god. Okay, I have 10,000 debens to start spending. Oh, I don't even have farms. I only have, interesting. And work camps, these are gonna be my backbone of my economy. Okay, let's start, I actually just wanna, preview the pyramid complex because you have to have a causeway here and as I remember it's very particular about where it wants to be um, so I'm probably gonna end up yeah just putting it there you don't want to take up too much yeah. Okay. Ah! The ostriches are in my way! This is not going swimmingly yet. Right. My mouse just doesn't like this. Right, I'm just starting that there. Okay, I'm going to play your first segment for you now, which is the uh, story of Khufu... Sword of Djedra, Khafra, and then Kaura. So they're more well known as the Pyramid Kings. I'm going to mute my mic while I do this. And um, if the audio levels are all carried over from my last stream, um, but if for some reason you can't hear anything, you have trouble hearing anything, I'm going to turn the game volume just down a little bit so you can hear my um, volume of my audio from my thing so I'm going to turn the game volume down just a smidge and then I'll start playing the um yeah the the other bit that I recorded like I said my brain is just oh it's fried <laughs> okay for the first level is Khufu second king of the fourth dynasty Lumped into this same level is a mention of his son Khafra, but then the game entirely skips his grandson Menkaura and the rest of the 4th dynasty. Since we covered Khufu's life in a great detail on my last stream, I'll do a quick summary here before moving on to discuss his son and grandson. Khufu's full throne name was Khunum Khufu, which means Khunum protect me. Later Greek historians also called him Cheops. His Horus name was Majedu, which means who has been adhered to slash followed. He had at least two wives and 14 children. Estimates for the length of his reign hover around 29 years. He is responsible for the building of the Great Pyramid. The most complete three-dimensional depiction of him that has survived is a small ivory figurine known as the Khufu statuette, which shows him with the red crown of Lower Egypt seated on a throne. Everything known about him comes from inscriptions at Giza and documents written well after his lifetime. Greek historians Herodotus and Diodorus of Sicily, both writing nearly 2,000 years after Khufu's death, depict him as a heretic and cruel tyrant abhorred by his subjects, which has led to the modern myth that he forced slaves to build his monuments. When looking at these Greek records, we need to be aware of the fact that they were made by foreign visitors writing well after any kind of living memory of Khufu would have disappeared. Their sources are often unnamed and thus unverifiable, and Greeks in particular had low opinions of kings and thus had a motive to portray him the way they did. These later histories have clearly shaped the messaging of our mission briefing, but personally, they don't have any support in the evidence that I have been able to find. Khufu actually had a long-lasting cultural impact in Egypt after his death through his mortuary cult. 
Certainly, I found no references to prophecies about suffering or oppression under him, as mentioned in other mission briefings in the game. After Hufu died, his immediate successor was his son Dejedfra, also called Ra Jadef, whose name translates to Ra is his stability. He is the king who introduced the title Son of Ra and the first to connect his cartouche name with the sun god Ra. His mother is unknown, but I came across an interesting but now disproven story that he was Hufu's son by a blonde, beautiful Libyan queen, and he seized the throne through murdering his brother, Crown Prince Kawab. There is no evidence of this queen existing or how Dejedfra came to the throne, but he did marry his sister Hetaperes II, widow of Kawab. He also had another queen named Kentekenka, who is depicted in statue fragments from Dejedfra's mortuary cult. From his consorts, he had between five and seven children. The Turin king list says he ruled for eight years. Archaeologically, the highest known year referred to during his reign appears to be the year of his 11th cattle count. This was found written on the underside of the massive roofing block beams which covered Khufu's southern boat pit. Generally, Jajedra is thought to have ruled between 10 to 22 years, depending on if the cattle count was done annually or biennially. The relatively few monuments and records left by him do not seem to favor a very long reign. He built a now-ruined pyramid at Abu Rawash, eight kilometers to the north of Giza. It was previously assumed that this pyramid was unfinished upon his death, but recent excavations from 1995 to 2005 have established that it was indeed completed and its current state of degradation is the result of extensive plundering in later periods when it was quarried for its stone. The succession situation after Dejedfra's death is unclear. Some scholars propose that he was succeeded immediately by one of his own sons, who only ruled for a short time. At some point, another of Khufu's sons, called Khafra, became king. The throne name Khafra means he appears as Ra, and Khafra's Horus name was Uthur Ib, meaning strong-minded. He had several wives, including his niece Marathank, and possible half or full sister Ka Meronebti I. He had at least 12 sons and three or four daughters. There is no agreement on how long he ruled. The Turin king list length for his reign is blank. Most scholars believe it was between 24 and 26 years. Hafra built the second largest pyramid at Giza and is commonly thought to have built or carved the Sphinx as well. Greek historians Diodorus and Herodotus also depicted him as a tyrant. Of all the rulers of the Old Kingdom, the greatest number of his statues have been found. Almost all are from Giza, mainly from the area around the temple complexes of his pyramid. In the large hall of his valley temple, 23 depressions have been found in the floor where life-size statues once stood. In 1860, August Mariette found nine of these statues and fragments of a tenth in a pit within the Valley Temple. The most famous is called Khafra Enthroned. It's a Ka statue made of green diorite, a valuable, extremely hard and dark stone brought 400 miles down the Nile. Its use highlights Khafra's importance and power as a ruler. The statue shows him with one hand flat upon his thigh and the other with his fist closed, seated on a wooden throne made of two stylized lion's bodies. The sides are carved with lotus and papyrus plants, symbolizing Upper and Lower Egypt, and a hieroglyphic symbol can also be seen that means union. He wears the traditional Nemeth headdress. When looking at the back of the statue, you can see the wings of a hawk resting upon his shoulders. His feet rest upon a flat platform engraved with nine archery bows, representing the king and kingdom's dominance over foreign and domestic enemies. He shows no movement or change, suppressing all motion and time to create an eternal stillness. His strong build and permanent stance demonstrate that he is timeless and his power will exist even in the afterlife. This statue and its brethren are now on display in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Our last king for today is Khafra's son, Menkaura. 
He is not mentioned in the game, but I'm including him here because to not do so leaves the story of Rothjaw or Giza incomplete. Mankaura is his throne name, which means the established one of the Ka of Ra. His horse name was Kahet, which translates to the bull of the divine corporation. He is thought to have had at least two wives, Ka Merunebti II, a half-sister, and Queen Reketra, another possible half-sister who was buried separately in a shaft tomb. He built two queen's pyramids south of his own, however their intended occupants are unknown. Like his father and grandfather, the opinions on the length of his reign vary from 18 to 22 years. Traditionally, Mankaura has been referred to as a pious and just king, but archaeologically there is not a wealth of information available about him. He and his tomb have also acquired a number of legends and myths over the years. One states that he had his beloved daughter entombed inside a gigantic gold-covered wooden cow. Another describes how a Greek slave girl named Rodothis, her sandal was stolen by an eagle and dropped into Mankaura's lap. Overwhelmed by the sandal's perfume, he orders a search for its owner, and then when she is found, he marries her. This tale was first recorded by the Greek historian Strabo in the late 1st century BCE or early 1st century CE, around the time of Augustus and when Jesus lived and is considered the earliest known variant of the Cinderella story. There is no archaeological evidence for either of these two stories that I mentioned. Mankaura's pyramid and mortuary temple were unfinished at his death, and his successor, Shepsiskaf, completed them. In 1910, excavations in his valley temple uncovered some of the finest sculptures of the pyramid age, carved in a smooth-grained, dark stone called grey wax or schist. There were a number of triad statues. Each showed three figures, the king, the goddess Hathor, and a god representing a local district which was dr different in each triad. There were four complete triads, one that was incomplete and one that was in fragmentary condition. Three of these can be found in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo and two in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Also found was a perfectly preserved and nearly life-size statue of two figures standing side by side on a simple squared base and supported by a shared back pillar. The base would, would have normally been inscribed with the names and titles of the statue subjects was left blank. Because it was found in Mankaura's Valley Temple and resembles other statues from the same area that bear his name, there is no doubt that the male figure is King Mankaura. However, the identity of his female companion is unknown. It's most commonly assumed to be one of his wives and queens, but it has also been suggested that it might have been his mother. Today, this statue can be seen at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts. Okay, now it's time to talk about our site for today, Rothjaw as the game. Okay, uh, hold on, I'm gonna get my notes. While you were there, I've set up my town, but I wasted a bunch of money, apparently, because <laughs> I made all this stuff before I had citizens, and now I have to replace all of it because it all collapsed. Um, that's great. Great that that's happening for me. I also, I've, ha I've started the work on the Great Pyramid, so with its causeway, I've moved it just a little bit up uh, to give myself some space for the Sphinx later and then like a little worker industrial bit that I have going here. Um, hopefully now these guys will start getting some workers and I can do another gemstone mine and I'll do a storage yard here for my gems. I'll just start off with one. Again, I don't want to waste too much money too early on on things. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, I'm also going to need a storage yard here because Pharaoh is going to gift me with some white limestone eventually. Or at least I... He better. I'll be really mad if he doesn't. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, uh, let's see, let's look at the chat. It looked good in this video. Thanks. I, like I said, I'm incredibly jet lagged. I have no makeup on because I just, I didn't, I haven't had time. I was prepping this stream when I got home. I was unpacking about half of my luggage and, uh, you know, getting some food. Um, great. We've got some stone already being harvested. I love that for me. Um, let's see. Let's have a quick look. Okay. Unemployment of 40%. That means that I can do two more of these and then I can, let's do another gemstone mine. That's going to be good. And we'll start doing some oh, work on food. So I think I want, where are all of the ostriches? Okay, so there's a bunch here. There's a bunch up here. They're all up there. I think I'm going to have to do a bit of a... We'll do this. We'll have our granary here, and then we'll do two hunting lodges here. And these houses are just going to have to deal with the fact that they're near that. And let's do some hunting lodges here as well. Uh, there. And because I just realized I forgot, I need my architect's post and my firehouse. And I'll do that for the other one too. Boom. And boom. That should hopefully, yeah, brought me down to 16%. Not too bad. So yes, um, hi, Strange Road. And... Um, Thanks for coming along. I have sent you an email um, about the email that I got from you. Um, let me know if you've received it. Um, we can chat on Instagram or email about that. Um, and yeah, diorite is a, it's a crazy stone. Um, I actually also, I didn't put it in the segment, but um, the Khufu and Throne statue, let's see if I can just find it in my um, thing. As the mission briefing uh, tells us, let's our just scroll through. That's Jedfra, Kafra. So this this um, statue that you see here is one of the source of one of my favorite archaeology memes, which is um, I can't remember what it is exactly. I'm gonna have to look it up. Uh, Kafra meme, I guess. Uh, oh yeah, so it's basically this statue. Um, and is the, with a caption of when you dedicated your whole life to building the pyramids and then you see aliens getting the credit and then it zooms in on <laughs> the picture of his fist on his thigh being like, uh, <laughs> I just love that. I think that's actually hilarious. Um, okay. Who, so these guys, okay. So I'm going to need a dock. So let's get my trade bit up and running here because yeah I'm gonna need some pretty significant trading happening here in order to make some money so let's do our gems and we're gonna export these when they're over a thousand but I also need to make a road to this so that the guys from the dock can come here sweet Right. We're up and running, guys. I've got 541 Deben left. I haven't started taxing people yet, but that's fine, actually. For now, I'm going to put the road going like this because I anticipate I am going to put Kafra's Pyramid somewhere in this bit. Um, let me know in the chat. It, which one of your the pharaohs that I've or the kings that I've mentioned so far is your favorite? Do you like Khufu? Do you like Khafra? Do you like Menkaura? Um, I thought or I thought it was really interesting to learn about the um, all these myths and legends about Menkaura, especially the Cinderella story. Like I've I've read about Rodophis or Rodophis before, 
Um, but I think it's really interesting um, that, you know, the Cinderella story, which I feel is like quite a, I, I guess people don't realize like the antiquity of that kind of stuff. Also, it's a, it's, it is a kind of story that has like quite a, like it's seen across like retold many across many different cultures. But I think it's really interesting that basically that myth can be dated back about 2000 years because keep in mind even though this myth is set in Egypt 4500 years ago um, the person who actually wrote it down lived 2000 years ago so um, yeah not as ancient as perhaps we think um, I have also when I'm doing the uh, research for this at videos it gives me such I don't know if regret is the right word but like I just think of how um, I have been to the Cairo Museum and, you know, looked inside of it. And I don't remember seeing half of the stuff that I mentioned on the streams because, I, you know, there's so much to see. And I think I got a bit like, oh, Khufu or sorry, oh, oh Tutankhamun because they have the, the Tutankhamun room. Um, but it makes doing all my research for this just makes me want to um go on a trip to Egypt just so I can again like go to the museum and see everything there um oh crap I've done this badly I need to these guys the gemstone mines don't have enough workers so maybe now I can 10 percent fabby fabby okay I'm starting to have some income from my gems that's good i've also i when i was reading about this level in advance apparently there's going to be like a military incursion at some point so i need to eventually do some army bits um but yeah i've never been to the boston fine arts museum but i would really like to go i've i've never been to boston i've never been to new york but yeah um, I don't know if they ever put those, um, statues on tour if they ever leave. Um, I think it's really interesting how they're, you know, these things are split between Cairo and Boston, um, mostly because, uh, a lot of the archaeological digs that found a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today, um, were run by like American expeditions and they clearly had some kind of agreement in place that I don't know they I don't know if it's exactly this but they like half and half the <laughs> um, the artifacts that they found so that's why a bunch of them are in Boston a bunch of them are in Britain and a bunch of them are in Cairo um, you could also probably I'm sure there's a little bit of like colonial statue collecting going on um, I don't, so I don't know so much about the British Museum ones but uh yeah uh i'm sure egypt would like to have everything back in egypt i think that's generally their their stance on just about everything um but yeah right i'm gonna zoom up a little bit because i well a i would like to try and beat this sometime soon but I need to get some food sources um, for people. Uh, I need to have start leveling up my city a little bit. Da, 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 da. Right, I'm gonna export linen and luxury goods. I think I'll, yeah, maybe put, well, maybe put a jeweler in. Um, once I have my next um, thing of gems. Oh, I have so much Deben left over. Okay, let's give 2000 Deben to the city. So yeah, ev basically your savings from your last missions carries over into your next one. So um, I have 5000 Deben, so I'm gonna put up a jeweler and then I'll do a storage yard that will take luxury goods and then I can start doing some stuff so let's do 
another jeweler. I'm gonna do my town palace. Where should I have that go? Um, I think that that's gonna basically end up being a bit of an ornament for um, another settlement that I'll do like over here eventually. Um, but we'll just have this here for now. And an architect's post. And then I can put in tax collectors, which again is another way of um, deriving a little bit of income. All right. How was everybody's Christmas? Let me know in the chat what your favorite thing that you did at Christmas was or your favorite present that you got. And um, after at least one person says it in the chat, I will tell you mine. <laughs> All right, new trade route. Buy in it. I only buy straw. That's not very useful. <laughs> Uh, making progress on the Great Pyramid. Fantastic. Um. <laughs> Alright, if no one's going to take my bait. <laughs> um. I'll tell you what my favorite. So I don't know if it's like, like obviously you enjoy Christmas and everything to do with your family and stuff. But um, when my husband and I went back this time for Christmas with my family, we um, did a escape room with my parents, um, which was actually really fun. Uh, we also did an escape room with my best friend when we were staying with her uh, for the first few days. So we managed to do and complete two escape rooms, which was really fun. Um, and like the one that we did with my parents was actually insane. Um, very complex, very cool. It had like a bunch of secret rooms and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, oh, oops. <laughs> Ran out of Debbins. Whoopsie daisy. Um, okay, let's export over. We'll do 200 here because, yeah, if I'm not careful, somebody will ask me for it and then I'll be screwed. Um, okay, let's do also, I'm going to do... it over here It'll be connected by that um so my dad got my husband and I so my dad's like thing that he gets people for Christmas nowadays is Lego um a few years ago my brother bought like the at, at walker um during like COVID times and we as a family did that all together and really 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 enjoyed it um just the whole process of making it and putting it together so uh this year he got one for my mom one for my brother and then one for my husband and i um each like our own sets and my husband's favorite film like childhood film is jurassic park and the, my dad, so my dad got us, he like bid on eBay and got us the Jurassic Park, like a disc, a discontinued set. That's like the original, um, gate as you like enter the, the park. And then also is a, um, Uh, and then, yeah, so it's a T-Rex, a like a T-Rex, and then the gate that goes into the park. And it is massive. <laughs> like, the T-Rex, we built it over Christmas, um, weighs as much as my cat. It's basically the same size as Emma. Um, 
which is kind of crazy. And, um, <laughs> uh, the gate we got partway through, but didn't manage to finish, um, which is fine. We actually had to leave it in Canada because it was so big. Um, <laughs> we couldn't, we couldn't fit it in our luggage. I really miscalculated luggage this year. I usually, my husband and I take two suitcases, but this time we only, I, I wanted to try and like save a bit of money on checked baggage. So we only took one suitcase and it like, I didn't factor in how much stuff we usually bring home. Um, so that was interesting to have to, um, yeah, uh, negotiate essentially. Um, I think, I feel like I can make this easier. I feel like I could put this here and that would make things a bit easier for stuff. Um, yeah, so we'll have to go back sometime and, um, like finish, finish the set and then bring it back to Canada. But, um, yeah. It was really great. I, I really enjoyed doing it. Um, and yes, my uh, my family slash husband does have great taste in films. Well, most, some, some films. He really likes horror films, which are not my not my cup of tea. Um, but that's fine. He's, a, he's allowed to have stuff that I don't like. Oh, copper. Okay. Um, storage yard. You can accept copper. We'll do a weaponsmith as well. How am I doing for my population? Not great. Except. Keeps the supply of food for my local bazaar. to import some food so this storage yard is going to be my food one I'll, uh, I'll import grain that'll be cheaper than meat mm. oh okay I guess I'll get that at some point I need that anyway. Iron it. They don't buy anything useful, so I'm not going to open a trade route there yet. Hopefully another one opens up. I don't know where I'm supposed to get these um, grain from. That's weird. Right. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to just accelerate some gameplay here and I will put on the next segment. Um, like I said, we've got six to get through today. So, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, the next one is going to be about the site of Rothjaw slash Giza. Uh, talk a little bit about, you know, what's there, including the pyramids, what's there outside of the pyramids, and then what's the history of it outside of what we're playing in the game, um, especially excavating wise and who's excavated there. Um, this scratches the surface of, of the history of this site. Um, to be honest, I could do an entire, probably like hour long video talking about this on my channel. If you might be interested in watching that, let me know. Um, but it's also, really cool because there's a site called Digital Giza that I'm going to link, um, which amalgamates like everything that we know about the site um, and does like a really good job of <clears throat> um, amalgamating everything into one place. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's really good. Um, A resource for people um, if you are so interested uh, yeah uh, okay I'm gonna mute my mic and then play the segment okay now it's time to talk about our site for today Roth 
Jaw, as the game calls it, but we all more popularly know as Giza. It's located southwest of modern Cairo, where a limestone cliff abruptly rises to form a sandy desert plateau. The ancient Egyptians called this place Emmentet, meaning the west, but also Kher Neter, which means the necropolis or the city of the dead. The exact meaning of its modern name Giza is unknown, but it's been suggested that it comes from an irregular Aramaeo-Arabic root meaning edge or side. It's also been suggested that that meaning comes from the ancient Egyptian word Rus Geher, which means on the site of the height pyramid. This is where I think today's level name of Rothja comes from. The site forms the northernmost part of the 16,000 hectare pyramid fields in the western desert edge of the Nile Valley. It is most famously home to the Great Pyramid, the Pyramid of Khafra, and the Pyramid of Menkaura, and the Great Sphinx. But there are many more other archaeological remains here as well. All of its most famous structures were built during the 4th dynasty of the Old Kingdom of Ancient Egypt, roughly 4,500 years ago. It should be noted that the pyramids were not standalone structures. They are each part of a much larger complex that includes a temple at the base of the pyramid itself, enclosure walls and corridors, smaller satellite or queen's pyramids, and a second temple, known as a valley temple, some distance away to the east and connected to the pyramid temple by a causeway. These valley temples were used to perpetuate the cult of the deceased king and were active places for worship of them for hundreds of years, sometimes longer, after the king's death. Giza also hosts hundreds of regular shaft and mastaba tombs that were constructed both while the royal monuments were being made and for centuries after. These served as the eternal resting places for the royal family and bureaucratic elite of that time. More recently, quarries, a workers' village, and an industrial complex have also been found, which have further proved that the pyramids and their structures were built by Egyptians, not slaves or aliens. A notable construction on the site is a cyclopean stone wall called the Wall of the Crow. Outside of this wall, a worker's town has found, been found which was dated by pottery styles, seal in impressions, and stratigraphy to have been constructed and occupied sometime during the reigns of Khafra and Menkaura. A mound found in the south field of the plateau contained a variety of artifacts including mud brick seals of Khufu, and has been labeled as an artisan settlement. A worker's cemetery used at least between Khufu's reign and the end of the 5th dynasty was also discovered south of the Wall of the Crow. The remains of a bustling port and barracks for sailors or military troops has been discovered alongside a basin that may have been an extension of the harbor or waterfront. The Diary of Merer, a papyri discovered at a Khufu age port on the Red Sea coast describes the existence of such a harbor complex called Rosha Hufu, which means entrance to the lake or basin of Hufu. Recent paleoecological analyses have helped to reconstruct the 8,000 year fluvial history of the Nile in this area, showing that the former waterscapes and higher river levels from around 4,500 years ago would have allowed engineers to exploit a former channel of the Nile and harness the annual 7-meter rise of the flood like a hydraulic lift, allowing them to bring higher water levels to the base of the plateau and making it possible to transport supplies and building materials directly to the pyramid complex. Giza has been explored and excavated more thoroughly than any other site in Egypt, possibly more than any other site in the world. I'm going to give you a brief timeline of its history, but if you want more detail, you should really check out the Digital Giza Project by Harvard University. It's a nonprofit international digital archaeology project which assembles, curates, and presents archaeological records about Giza. They have a full timeline of the site's history on their website, which is linked in the description of this stream. You may be surprised to learn that while human activity at Giza was at its height during the 4th dynasty, it was not limited to that time. 
A thousand years after the Fourth Dynasty, the Sphinx became the focal point of religious dedication in the New Kingdom. At this time, kings erected buildings nearby, and royal and non-royal people alike set up stele as expressions of devotion. The late period also saw a renewed interest in old traditions, which prompted a revival of burial activity at the site. Older monuments were refurbished or expanded, and new burial shafts were struck into the plateau. From the 6th century BCE onward, Greek tourists visited and admired the pyramids, and eventually named the Great Pyramid one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Given their size and prominence in the landscape, Giza and its pyramids were never quote-unquote lost to the sands of time. However, after the Pharaonic period, they went through a long time of general neglect and disinterest. The pyramids themselves were most likely robbed in antiquity, and the purpose of the Great Pyramid itself was eventually forgotten, as demonstrated by an early Christian pilgrim claiming that the pyramids were made by Joseph to store grain. A few centuries later, the Abbasid Caliph is said to have tunneled into the side of the Great Pyramid and discovered the ascending passage and its connecting chambers. In the 12th century, another sultan tried to destroy the pyramid complex, but gave up after only damaging the Pyramid of Menkaura because the task proved too large. By the close of the Middle Ages, the Great Pyramid was thought to be haunted. In 1303, a massive earthquake loosened many of the outer casing stones, which were said to have been carted away for use in Cairo, a practice which continued up until fairly recently. Giza was brought back to the forefront of Western history and interest in 1798, when Napoleon invaded Egypt, bringing with him a small army of scientists and scholars who recorded the natural and cultural landscapes of Egypt, including its history. Their findings include some of the earliest academic documentation of Giza's landscape and monuments. Exploration of the site continued in the 1800s. Giovanni Caviglia completed the first systemic clearance of sand from the Sphinx's forelegs and found the dream stele of King Tutmos IV. He also exposed many massive tombs and entered some of the Great Pyramid's interior chambers. However, he caused as much damage as discovery with his use of dynamite to do so. His concern for the preservation of the Sphinx prompted him to rebury it for protection. In 1818, Giovanni Belzoni cleared an entrance to Khafra's pyramid and reached the burial chamber. In the 1830s, Howard Weiss and John Paring explored the three large pyramids and other monuments. Although they recorded their activities with excellent attention to detail, their use of gunpowder and dynamite to find the pyramid entrances and chambers was as destructive as it was revealing. In 1837, they found ancient workers' graffiti in the relieving chambers of the Great Pyramid, identifying Khufu as the monument's owner. In the 1880s, Flinders Petrie produced the most accurate survey of the pyramids up to that point. In 1903, the Egyptian Antiquity Service divided the site into three equal sections for excavation. Sections of the Western Cemetery were allotted by luck of the draw, and the three pyramid complexes and other surrounding cemetery areas were awarded by negotiation. George Reisner received the northernmost cemetery sector and Mankaro's Pyramid. George Steindorf received the middle section and Khafra's Pyramid, along with the area behind the Sphinx. Ernesto Schiaparelli received the southernmost section, the Hufu Pyramid, and the Eastern Cemetery. From 1912 to 1914 and 1925 to 1929, Herman Junker excavated the central section of the Western Cemetery. Among his most significant finds is the tomb of Hemeunu, a high official and cousin of Hufu, whose listed titles included Overseer of All Construction Projects of the King which has led to the conclusion that he was probably the architect of the Great Pyramid. In 1950, clearance work identified two long boat pits covered with massive stone slabs. In 1954, the eastern pit's contents were identified. A large dismantled cedarwood boat over in over 1,200 pieces. In the 1970s, Abdelaziz Salah uncovered the remains of houses, storage and cooking facilities, and stoneworking debris south of the Mankaura Causeway, possible evidence of an industrial settlement. In 1987, Dr. Zahi Hawass 
launched the first ever site management plan for the whole plateau, and he oversaw excavations in several areas. During the 1990s, his work uncovered what is now known as the Cemetery of the Pyramid Builders. The upper cemetery on higher ground is occupied by more than 100 tombs of elite, while at least 700 smaller tombs and burials fill the lower cemetery. In 1985, American Mark Lenner embarked on the Giza Plateau Mapping Project. He also formed the Ancient Egypt Research Associates ERA organization, the ongoing work of which has aimed to especially understand the socioeconomics behind the development of the site through its settlements. Having set up the first survey grid for spatial con- control of the entire plateau, Leonard's teams have excavated or re-excavated various areas of Giza to advance study with modern methodologies and technologies. ERA's most prominent work has been on the site of Hait al hurab the so-called Lost City of the Pyramids, a large multifaceted contemporary settlement located to the south of the Sphinx. Additional areas of work have included the Pyramid Town of Queen Tenkaus, the Menkaura Valley Temple, and Giza Harbor areas that front the Sphinx and neighboring valley temples. From 1992 to 2010, Russian teams constructed four unmanned vehicles to explore the so-called air shafts inside the Great Pyramid. In 2017, the Scan Pyramids project started using muon tomography, a.k.a. cosmic particle rays, to look for voids or cavities in the Great Pyramid, allowing the team to avoid further damaging the monument. They have discovered several cavities since they started, and the project continues to this day. Despite all this work, the site has not been fully excavated, and even now, new evidence is discovered on a regular basis. Exactly how big Giza is may never be known, as the research is nowhere near complete. Preservation efforts and a resurgence of national pride have put a stop to further degradation of the pyramids. It is believed that had the site not been robbed to provide stone for later building projects, the pyramids would still remain to this day as they were when they were built. As the saying goes, man fears time, but time fears the pyramids. The Great Pyramid of Giza As the mission briefing tells Okay, the Great Pyramid of Giza and its funeral Okay, that's the that's our second segment finished. Uh, all about the um, the site of Giza. I think it's really interesting to include and talk about as well because a, a lot of the time as an archaeologist, you get like questions of people being like, "Oh, what 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 is there left for us to discover? What is there left yet to dig?" And you know, I think it pretty clearly shows that. You know, Giza, you know, is one of the most, like I said, if not the most excavated site in the world, and they still are finding things. So I think that just kind of goes to show how there still is so, 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 so much to to be found um, at these places. So, um, yeah, um, I just think that that's interesting. Um really too bad that they were so keen on dynamite in the early days uh, which has certainly uh, meant that there is a lot less of the pyramid to um, look at than we maybe would have liked oh look we're getting some help from the gods that's good oh, look he's helping me level my pyramid ground that's great um, Maybe I'll just put in some more work camps here just for now to help A, suck up some unemployment and B, get this show on the flippin' road. Taz should be happy with me, come on. Also, you may have seen that I got a a city requesting goods but uh if you actually looked at the message which i mean for a long time i just ignored these and i would just like fill them with whatever but i'm actually being extorted by someone who's threatening me um so if i actually did fill that order that like request i would actually it would impact my kingdom rating negatively because i would be seen as giving in to 
people, my husband's crawling on the floor behind me to try and look at our boiler, um, which, as I said, has been giving us some problems lately. Um, not my favorite. Okay, I need to send these. And hopefully that will mean I get some limestone as a gift. That would be nice. Let's see if we can get some stuff done here. Dynamite was a particular favorite with paleontologists. Yeah. It's so funny how we, as far we've come and how, you know, you just look back on how people used to do things and you're like, ah. but to be fair, I mean, um, How much help do they need? Small force. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was I saying? Um, yeah, because obviously, like, the pyramids were in some ways, like, sealed off uh, without, you know, they weren't meant to have entrances and all that stuff. So um, it's actually quite useful uh in some ways that those guys blaze that trail because you know now we try to do things as non-destructively as possible um so that just means that you know that's why we do the things with the muon tomography and stuff like that we're trying to kind of scan and effectively x-ray the pyramids to avoid damaging them any further um but that means that obviously limits what we can do there uh yeah the miss the good old days, it was much quicker. You mean in the game or in when they use dynamite? Do you subscribe to the theory? Um, I, well, I don't know about external ramps. Certainly, I, I think uh, ramps of some sort were used. There's a couple different theories about how they're, this game specifically is using like the external kind of spiral ramp method which was um, suggested by, it's been put forward by Mark Lenner. He's one of the like main people who excavates, who's excavated at Giza. He's the one who founded ERA and all that kind of stuff. And he's done a lot of the work at the worker like villages. Um, and um, uh, there are some people that think you know, there's theories that there's one that they just built it from a long ways away and just went all the way up to the top. I think a spiral makes a bit more sense to me. Um, certainly, I think it probably did follow this idea of you built up the inner core and then you kind of finished it going down. Um, there's a few there's a few other theories, but, you know, some kind of ramps um, in my Lego pyramid video. I talk a bit more about there's actually like a quarry site that I think it's a Japanese team um, have been excavating. It's called Hatnub. Um, they uh, have discovered the remains of like a ramp there that was used to quarry to use to transport quarried stone, um, and um, it's of it like roughly contemporary with the fourth dynasty so that clearly proves that they had knowledge of ramps they probably also used um some kind of like crane or lever system um i'm gonna actually empty these storage yards because it doesn't seem like the workers are gonna come this far to get stuff so if i can um get it that way ah dashur see sending troops to help them out was a good choice so they sell beer, barley, noticing they buy gems. Perfect. More people to sell gems to. Still haven't found whoever's going to be sending me, um, who I can import grain from though. I don't know if maybe that's just like, that'll come later or perhaps um, I'll just get it gifted to me if I make Pharaoh happy. I'm actually going to just import a bit of supplementary meat because clearly 
I'm not providing enough food for everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, it doesn't cost that much. So let's import 400 of this and see if I can balance that out. I would really like to as well. I think I'm going to do some more gem, gem mines, um, which means actually I have to get rid of this storage yard because I'm going to have to expand over this way. So I need another storage yard. Let's put that here. Put that on gems only. And we'll do another gemstone mine or two. Give to city. That will pay some dividends. Put the architect's post right at the end here because otherwise they're going to forget. Um, yeah, otherwise they will they will a hundred percent forget to check on these mines and then they're just going to collapse and waste all that money that I just spent. Yeah, the dynamite it got things done a lot quicker. <laughs> But yeah, uh, definitely better to try and not destroy things. I mean, it's kind of weird. Archaeology is a just destructive process. You can't not destroy things as you excavate them. But yeah, the less we do that, the better. Oh, so they are coming here now. Okay, I guess I don't need to do that then. Look at all my teams. Hollen stone. There's also a really interesting theory about in terms of how they hauled the stone. Um, there's like a there's a hiero like a like hieroglyphic art relief whatever somewhere that depicts people hauling like a statue, not this stone. Um, and in that relief. So A shows that they were able, that they used a sim system similar to this, but um, it also showed somebody pouring something in front of the sledge and a bunch of experimental archeologists tested that and were actually able to, sh to determine that when you used water, which they had in abundance, um, they could, um, and they wet the sand in front of the sledge, it actually made it go faster. So um, just like some simple, simple geo geology and physics there. Um, I think I'm also just going to start my Sphinx because I'm aware that I'm like an hour in here and I'm just on the first, first course of the pyramid. So this is going to be, so this is not a hundred percent accurate, but I'm just following the the spirit of the um, of the original game because I want to have like I'm gonna put a road in right next to the Sphinx which is gonna be my causeway to my Menkaura uh, uh, sorry my Tikhofra's pyramid and the Sphinx needs to be there yeah well, it is on cleared land um, and also I will point out that this <laughs> game, while great, is entirely disproportionate. The Sphinx is not nearly um, as big in size, like, as relation uh, ratio to the Great Pyramid as this in real life. It's, it's much, much smaller. Um, oh, sweet. Raw is happy again. Right. Getting all the help from the gods. I like when they do that for me. They're nice guys sometimes. Most of the times they're mad at me, but sometimes they like me. And I give them lots of festivals. And 5%. And then pour logs in front. Yeah, I mean, there's a variety of ways that they would have done it. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty clear that they used sledges and probably maybe used other things as well to, to speed along the, um, the process. guys are going to need pottery next. 
Yeah, Libyan army. I'm not afraid of them. I really like having the academy, which means that my soldiers are slightly more powered up than normal, so I can get away with just two companies here. These guys appear to be just like stuck. Might have to get some copper to beef up my infantry later. Mm, I should have put this settlement slightly farther back. Well, I can't really do that because I need the water. Um, but I need to make some kind of industrial settlement, which I think I'm going to end up doing here. Um, because I need to start making some other goods to level up my housing. So, let's do this. Uh, that's not going to work, is it? No. Let's do this. Right, so we're going to... So we've got one, two, three... One, two, that's generally my layout for industrial complexes. So I've got a row of um, storehouses and then et cetera, et cetera. And this will be nice and close to my docks. So let's do the firehouse and the architect's post. And I'll do a brewery because if we can get some beer going then I can get beer for food stuff which people like and then um, I can uh, sell my excess beer as well and barley is much much cheaper to import than beer is in this game let's do 400 yeah barley is cheap very very cheap let's go back to my favored view and hopefully, well, let's see. These guys still don't like the granary. All right, let's put some plazas in. Maybe that will encourage people to level up their housing. Sweet, people will work for less. Great, that means I can lower my wages and that can help with saving some money. bit of extra housing there. Uh, Vikings do the same thing with ships to pull them from the river. Yeah. They might have used, I, to be fair, I don't know if they would have used logs to in front of them because we have to think about the scarcity of wood in this situation. Um, probably they would have just used wood for the sledges and then used the water in front, but you never know. It could be proven wrong. There was a video going around on social media for a while that was um, the um, that was like an archaeological team experimenting with pulling pulling this stuff, and they were able to show that yeah, they were able to do it, um, which was pretty cool. See if I can. Oh, great. Oh, trade by water. Fantastic. <clears throat> Ivan, do you know how long it would take him to. Probably, yeah, about roughly the length of Khufu's reign, which is around 30-ish years, and probably a little bit after to completely finish it. Um, we know that Dejedfra, or Rajadeth, um, I think actually, you know, he finalized a lot of stuff. It's, it's his name, I think, that's on some of the slabs that are found over the boat pits. Um, there's even some theories that, again, with the Sphinx, that is that he had the Sphinx carved in the image of Khufu, his father, or maybe himself. Um, so 
Yeah, it's been demonstrated again with the experimental archaeology, and I go into this a lot more in my Lego video. Um, experimental archaeology has found that they would have been able to cut the blocks of stone at the rate that they would have needed it to build it within about 20 ish, 20, I think it's like 27 um, to 30 years, uh, because obviously they had a really big workforce and then um you know as the more you do a job you get better at it so even if they weren't necessarily um producing a lot at the very beginning um the team that did the experimental archaeology just found that as they went on and they got better at it they were able to produce it at a more regular rate and obviously the pharaohs had or the kings had access to you know a workforce of you know thousands and uh and this was how those thousands paid their taxes and it also um meant that they uh had some job security i didn't really talk about i talked about this again lego video but you know everyone wants job security if you're a stonemason or someone that cut stone um living in ancient egypt at this time your working life probably encompassed the building of a pyramid you know the average age uh age ranges for people and how long they lived went much 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 lower than it is today they probably mostly lived to i would say between 40 and um 60 years old if that so if you think about that you know one of these projects represents job security that you're going to have work for your entire career <laughs> um which everybody likes, um, you know, there's demonstration that the, the workers that worked on these projects, you know, they were paid and compensated pretty well. As I said, they were fed, they were dressed and they were housed at the expense of the state during the time that they were working on this project. So um, that's pretty lucrative. Um, they also probably got some pretty good quality food because the state's providing that food um, and, you know, they'll, they'll have the best quality stuff, so to speak. Right. Let's let's level up uh let's start leveling up my these settlements so we're gonna put in some entertainment for everyone everybody wants to be entertained so this is gonna be hmm some creative stuff here so okay I'm gonna just kind of slow things down here because I'm about to do some creative rearranging here of my roads so that I can have a bandstand here stand here we'll have these guys go here and then this is going to be at my pavilion it's going to be apologies if you heard that that is my boiler okay all right i'm going to sell beer when it's over Um, did that answer your question, Ivan? Um, how long it would have taken to complete? Obviously, estimates vary. Some people think it could have been done a lot sooner. I think most people think it probably took the extent of, of Khufu's lifetime. You know, certainly he would have started work on the project probably as soon as he became king um, in order to finish it on, t in order to finish it. Um, and he was particularly long lived for a king as well. So, roadblock roadblock here and here oh crap well, I haven't fixed my problem have I now people can't go around right. bandstand here and there we go and then there we go 
Yes, you did. Thank you. You're welcome, Ivan. I hope you guys are like, there's four of you. You guys have been on here for ages. Thank you for attending my stream today. I appreciate that it is very long and you will probably all have better things to do, I'm assuming. Um, let's see how this goes. Oh yeah, well stonemasons are all busy with my pyramid. Hopefully I can do a temple soon and then the god, oh sorry, a festival soon and then the gods will give me another boost. That certainly helps out a lot in this game. Um, on meat, fine. I think I need to put in another jeweler. Uh, Great. I'm also be able to sell my exports for more money. Great, we're almost done here, guys. Woohoo! More help. And stonemasons are making some progress. Right. How far, how far are we? 34%. <laughs> Not very far is the answer to that quest, that non-question. Um, let's do some, I'll do a statue here as well. Help level up the desirability of some of these neighborhoods. I really am not getting enough um, food is very irritating. I really like to be able to have some grain. All right, also, let's put some potters in because I'm going to start doing some pot tray. Again, that helps me level up my housing. We'll import some clay. 200. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, also, let's have a look at our burial goods. We'll do all the beer just so that's done. Let's do all the luxury goods. Don't have any grammet, don't have any gems, that's fine. I'm not bothered about that. <clears throat> oh, look, we're making progress on our Sphinx. That's going to be good. And once this is done, I'll maybe start the other pyramid we'll see i think i'm being a bit limited by my amount of limestone so let's up it to 24. actually let's see what what's the limit that people are selling it to me 40 40. yeah well i'll wait up my meat that I'm importing. Let's see if that can make a difference. Right. Not a lot of time since the festival. Let's make Ta happy. Realistically, well, I need to build him a temple complex. Once I do that, he's going to be all over the place. I'm actually wondering if, well, I really don't want to waste it over here, but theoretically I could put it here and have it be a faux valley temple. Um, so it's like, yeah, I was told that Pharaoh is going to give me limestone and he really hasn't. He's just happy that I'm sending him other stuff, which is like kind of rude. Um, it would be better if he would send me stuff. can't export plain stone, I don't think. I can only import it. Right, we're getting there, guys. When I used to play this as a child, I didn't realize that you could speed it up. So I used to play this at like the normal 
speed. This is like the absolute maximum speed. Um, <laughs> and this level took me forever to finish. It's kind of crazy. Um, Nose of the Sphinx. That will be covered in the Sphinx fit. Actually, we've just finished our Sphinx. Let's have a look. Very nice. Um, nicely painted and colored, which is uh, in line with history. Um, on its little pedestal. I don't know if it was really on a pedestal like this. I, it was in an enclosure, and there's like a little temple at the front of it. Um, I don't really think it was this high up in real life. I could be wrong. Um, I can't really remember because I, I visited it many, many, many years ago. So um, that's not entirely something I remember. Um, great. Mm -hmm. Feel like more of my meat to be going to the other bit. Oh, 11,000, great. That's fantastic. Everything's just turning up slightly millhouse. Why is Pop so unhappy? All right, we'll do a festival. And then once I have some more people around, we will do his temple complex because that will make him happy. Um, that's why I think in the game he's not, they're not happy, the main god isn't happy until you build their temple complex. Pharaoh, my gosh, like, A, you're demanding, but B, um, it would be nice if I got gifted some limestone. We're getting there. 45%. Oh, nine. Wow. Talk about cheap. <laughs> yeah, wow. I really could use those nine blocks. Could use more like, you know, 24, 12, etc. I also need more food. Finished, finished, finished. Cool. Getting there, guys. Getting there. All right. Um, it's just about to be six, and I have quite a few of these segments left. So I think there's actually four. So we're going to do the next one, uh, which is on the Great Pyramid, and then we'll move on to the Sphinx at just after quarter after, just because I'm conscious I want to get these all done in time. There's no point in me having made them, so I'm not going to play them for you guys. So I'm going to mute myself and we'll go on to the next segment. The complex represents the pinnacle of the Egyptian pyramid building industry. It is the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that still exists. I have an entire video on the Great Pyramid itself where I build the corresponding Lego set while discussing the details about the actual monument's construction, purpose, and why it was a tomb belonging to Khufu. To avoid needless repetition, I'm going to give you the highlights and most relevant info here today. You can watch my Lego video if you want to know more. It's linked in the description. At 146 meters high and comprising of 2.3 million blocks, the Great Pyramid was the tallest man-made structure in the world for more than 3,800 years. It was known to the ancient Egyptians as Akhet Khufu, which translates to Khufu's horizon. 
We know its name because the non-royal tombs around the pyramid belong to people involved in Khufu's mortuary cult. The job titles written on their tombs include Overseers of the Scribes of the Pyramid Akhev Khufu or Supervisor of Funerary Priests of Akhet Khufu. The Great Pyramid has been determined to be around 4,600 years old using two methods. Firstly, through its attribution to Khufu and his chronological age based on archaeological and textual evidence. And secondly, via radiocarbon dating of organic material found inside the pyramid and its mortar. Inside the pyramid are three main chambers. The first was cut into the bedrock below it, but is unfinished. It's thought that it might have been planned to be the original burial chamber for the king, but it was abandoned in favor of a chamber inside the structure itself. The second is the Queen's Chamber, which is located exactly halfway between the north and south faces of the pyramid and also contains air shafts in the north and south walls. Lastly, the King's Chamber is reached through the Grand Gallery. This chamber is faced with unadorned granite blocks, as was the norm for that time, and contains an empty granite sarcophagus. Four additional granite slab relieving chambers have been found above the King's Chamber, which we think were intended to quote-unquote relieve the weight of the stone above to protect the roof of the king's chamber from collapsing. As already mentioned, one of the oldest, most prevailing myths about the pyramids is that they were built by slaves, with people often talking about they could find how they could find it hard to believe that it would have been completed or done any other way. The archaeological evidence begs to differ and shows that the workforce of the pyramids comprised several thousand skilled year-round workers, unskilled seasonal labor farmers, and support workers like scribes, bakers, carpenters, and water carriers. The people participating in the building of the pyramid were not doing so under duress. For the farmers who provided the unskilled manpower during the flood season, this was how they paid their taxes while also being fed, dressed, and provided shelter at the expense of the state. Not to mention that during the flood season, they had a lot of leisure time on their hands. This is demonstrated in the game by the workers' camps, uh, who provide walkers that alternate between work in the fields and building our monuments. Back to reality, the tombs of supervisors contain inscriptions regarding the organization of the workforce into gangs according to their skills, with each group having their own project leader and a specific task. We know the names of some of these gangs as they wrote them in red ochre paint on the limestone walls around the relieving chambers above the king's burial chamber. These names include the Horus Majedu is the purifier of the two lands gang, the Horus Majedu is pure gang, the Khufu excites love gang, and the white crown of Khnum Khufu is powerful gang. Unfortunately, while we know who built the pyramids, when they did it, and what it was built for, we have not been able to determine exactly how it was done, as no one left behind a dummy's guide to building pyramids, or at least not one that we've found so far. What we do know, we've had to piece together and test out using experimental archaeology. It's important to remember that the ancient Egyptians' building techniques seem to have developed over time. Later pyramids were not constructed in the same way as earlier ones. There are numerous theories on different ramp systems, stone cutting, hauling, etc. that have been put forward. The game seems to use the spiraling ramp system proposed by Mark Lenner. Another question commonly asked is where did the stone come from for building it and how was it all cut and assembled in Khufu's lifetime and that of his successors? Well, most of the plain limestone blocks that comprise the majority of the building material were, was quarried at Giza. Special stones were transported on great barges from distant locations. White limestone came from Tura and granite came from Aswan. In 2013, a papyrus logbook was discovered in the ancient Egyptian harbor of Wadi al Jarf on the Red Sea coast, which we've already mentioned here. Written by a middle-ranking official and inspector named Merer, this papyrus dates the 27th year of the reign of Khufu and documents the transportation of white limestone blocks from Tura to Giza by boat. Khufu's water funerary complex consists of two mortuary temples connected by a causeway, tombs for his immediate family and court, and three smaller pyramids for his wives, 
and an, an even smaller satellite pyramid and five buried solar barges. His pyramid temple has almost completely disappeared. Only some of the black basalt paving remains. There are only a few remnants of the causeway. The valley temple is buried beneath a modern village. Basalt paving and limestone walls have been found, but the site has not been excavated. On the east side of the Great Pyramid are four subsidiary pyramids that I've already mentioned. The three that remain standing to almost full height are popularly known as the Queen's Pyramids. The fourth is so ruined that its existence was not suspected until the first course of stones and later the remains of a capstone were discovered during excavations in 1991 to 1993. Three boat-shaped pits are located to the east of the pyramid. They are large enough in size and shape to have held complete boats, though so shallow that any superstructure, if there ever was one, must have been removed or disassembled. Two additional boat pits, long and rectangular in shape, were also found south of the pyramid, still covered with slabs of stone weighing up to 15 tons. I feel like what I've covered now should be more than enough to prove that the Great Pyramid was built by Egyptians for Khufu. As I said, I have a video with more detailed information on this, which you can watch elsewhere on the channel at your leisure. The Pyramid of Khafra is the second tallest and largest at Giza, called Where Khafra, meaning Great is Khafra. The Great Pyramid of Giza and its pyramid. Okay, well, that's the Great Pyramid. Um, so covered a few of the things that you guys have asked about. Um, are there any other follow-up questions uh, that you have for me uh, after that? Let me know in the chat if you do. Um, I'll happily try to answer them or to clarify any points. Um, as you may have seen, we are now 55% complete on the Great Pyramid, which is fantastic. So now that we're getting to a point where um, we can have some of our workforce freed up, we can uh, because obviously we don't need the worker men to the same extent, uh, we can start doing this. So I'm going to do my second pyramid in the, s trying to do roughly the same thing. So I have to just look at the, how, okay. So they're all basically whoop, in a line. Um, so I'll do the second one here. Um, yeah, the directions on this aren't like exactly the same, um, but they are quite close together. So actually maybe I'll put it medium pyramid. Like here. Yeah, I think that's roughly fine less close to the sphinx and I like, kind of moved the sphinx over but it's just a half a dozen really um, so hopefully those guys can get started on that and uh, yeah alrighty ho okay <laughs> yes well the inundation doesn't matter if I can't farm anything I really I'm annoyed by the fact that I don't have enough food for my entire populace. Like that's actually really bothering me. Maybe I've just put the settlement in the wrong spot. I should have put it closer to the hunting grounds, but still. <clears throat> Would have been nice. And then limestone is just more and more and more expensive. All right, got to pay those. I'm working on the wood. <sighs> Um, I'll put a nice large statue here. Another small sphinx here. Slightly different style than our usual, but that's fine. I have so much gems and this, this stuff, but I'm exporting it like crazy, so that's fine. <clears throat> I don't have to worry about economy or prosperity in this level. And the workers are getting started on my medium. Oh, you know, Ta, I, I appreciate this, but 
it would be great if you just helped my building projects out a little bit more. Oh, that's so much pottery. Uh, that's fine, I guess. So was the plan to get to the afterlife in style, but what exactly was supposed to happen on waking up in the afterlife? I mean, it's similar to kind of like heaven, I guess, in some ways. So like it was um, the way it kind of worked was you died and then you were in And let's also keep in mind that, you know, I'm painting it in very broad strokes and um their idea of the afterlife evolved over time so I, I don't know exactly how they thought of it in the old kingdom but the broad strokes of it are that you um you you're you have they had multiple parts to their spirit um so the ka is the one that's usually relevant to um dying um, and they believed that in order for your Ka to travel to the afterlife, it had to do so as if you were outfitted, as if you were in real life. So, um, and also that's why you had to have your um, stuff with you. You needed to have everything with you to get through the underworld to reach the afterlife. So the way that it generally worked was you kind of, I guess, like your spirit was awakened by the final rituals of how you were put into your tomb um, by priests. And then um, you were buried with like the Book of the Dead and talismans and charms and all of these things that were supposed to help you on this journey through the, the underworld, which is called the Juat. And um, so you travel through the Juat and you have to like, you know, it's like a hero quest, basically. You have to avoid you know traps you have to at certain points you have to have spells to um help you through certain bits or certain offerings for people um and then at the end of it you come before a court of the gods led by osiris um and that's when anubis weighs your heart against the feather of truth or ma'at or which is truth but it's also like this idea of like justness and you are judged on if you lived a good life or not. So if you um, didn't live a good, oh, this Libyan army over here. Okay, they're, well. Um, so if you lived a good life, um, you were fine. You were then allowed to, to pass into the underworld and then, uh, sorry, into quote unquote heaven, which is uh, called the field of reeds, which is like an idealized life. You know, it's, it's like our heaven, you just exist there and you have whatever you want you can do whatever you want and you just live a good life with the gods eternally um if your heart was judged wanting you were then your spirit was then eaten by a monster <laughs> and um yeah you just fully died i guess so um yeah that, that i hope that answers your question viverka let me know aside from the uh Construction of the Great Pyramid, were there other notable events or achievements during Khufu's reign? Not really. I mean, I say not really, I say not really that we know of yet. So like the the issue with the the fourth dynasty is that it's forty five hundred years ago. It goes so far back in time and we don't have a lot of textual documents that have survived because um, at that time for the especially for the pyramids, the trend was not to write your life story on your tomb that's why they're broadly empty on the inside in the burial chambers um they uh so they didn't like really leave a lot of records about him behind um that we've been able to find so far that might change in future i think it's really interesting that his valley temple is currently underneath modern buildings in Cairo I'd be very interested like if I you know won lots of money in the lottery or became a billionaire I would be attempting to buy houses in that area to excavate underneath them and then I could build new houses on top a little bit of commercial archaeology going there but um 
yeah, just looking at that valley temple and what might be able to be found there. Um, so anyway, a lot of what we know about Khufu and Khafra and Menkaura comes from, um, like I said, stuff at Giza, but then this stuff is written way after their lifetime, so we can't exactly treat that as being like, we know that's 100% true. You know, telephoned history happens. Um, so other things, uh, I did talk about this in my last stream when he was the, he was the king for that stream, so I went into kind of more detail about his life. Um, we do know that he had sent some expeditions into the Sinai. Um, he wasn't, he didn't seem to be as militarily active as his father was, um, but it seems like his dad basically established and built up a really good economy that he was then able to effectively exploit to, to build these ex incredibly expensive building projects for. Um, but yes. Sounds very similar to heaven and hell, yeah. Um, it That's just kind of how a lot of belief systems work. You know, you have a good and a bad. Um, I think they also had some kind of like equivalent to purgatory. That might just be where you're trapped in the underworld and you can't seem to get out, but I don't know that for sure. So don't take that as like Bible as, as 100%. That's exactly what happened because um, I could be wrong. Um, oh, it's a long time since some stuff. Let's see if we can get the gods to um, sponsor the end of our building project. We're 65%, 3% here, 63% complete on the Great Pyramid, and we are 5% complete on this one. Um, I also want to say, like, in the mission briefing, they talk about how Khafra's pyramid is beginning to being built during Khufu's reign, I highly doubt that that was the case. Um, again, this game from comes from 20 years ago, so I, I, I don't know exactly what information they were working off of, and obviously it's pretty clear that they condensed some things um, here, but as we kind of talked about, um, Khufu was actually succeeded first by a different son named Jajedpra, who wasn't even the crown prince for most of his reign. The, that crown prince was the Kawab, who clearly predeceased his father. Um, his wife, his sister wife, then married the next heir down, which is Rajadef or Dejedfra, um, who then became king, ruled maybe 10 years, could be as high as 22 if the cattle counts biennial, um, and built his own pyramid at Abu Rawash. So that actually continued a tradition of um, the kings, each new king chose a completely new burial site for their pyramids up to this point. So Jajedra followed that um, trend and built his pyramid at Abu Rawash, which is away from Giza. Um, and then he died. Maybe one of his son ruled for a short time. We're not sure. Uh, but at either way, Khafra came to the throne, uh, became king, and then started building his pyramid at Giza. So he really is the um, tradition breaker here. He's the one who started this trend of building at the same site as your father. And I say trend, it's not a very long lived one, but yeah. I wonder if priests were selling rituals to get the afterlife. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like the, the more money you paid, the richer you were the more likely you were to be able to get into the afterlife because you would have the artisans, you would have the spells, you would have the equipment that you needed to get you there. Um, definitely there was like that kind of social stratification. I actually don't really know. I've never like, you know, we always focus on the people in Egyptian tombs who, because we find these tombs, we're, we're able to know a lot about them, but I don't really know much about like the average pauper's tomb. Um, or the average person, did everybody get to have a rock cut tomb? You know, was the fact that they were just so common, you know, similar to how things happen today, you know, something starts out as being really expensive and then the more, uh, the longer it goes on, the cheaper it gets. Um, I don't know. All right, where are we at? 66. All right, we're gonna go into our Sphinx segment. So Viverka, listen up, because this is where we're gonna talk a little bit about the nose. Um, and I will answer your question about the animal mummies after we do that. 
complex. The Pyramid of Khafra is the second tallest and largest at Giza. Called Ware Khafra, meaning Great is Khafra, it has a base length of 215 meters and today rises to a height of 136 meters. When it was built, it would have been 143 meters high. The slope rises at a 53 degree angle, steeper than Khufu's angle of 51 degrees. It sits on bedrock 10 meters higher than Khufu's pyramid, making it appear to be the taller of the two when it's not. Due to the slope of the plateau, the northwest corner was cut 10 meters out of the rock subsoil and the southeast corner was built up. It is built in horizontal courses. The stone used at the bottom is very large, but as the pyramid rises, the stones become smaller, becoming only 50 centimeters thick at the apex. The courses are rough and irregular for the first half of its height, but a narrow band of regular masonry is clear in the midsection. Casing stones cover the top third, but the capstone and part of the apex are missing. The bottom course of casing stones was made out of pink granite, but the rest of the casing was Tura limestone. Close examination reveals that the corner edges of the remaining casing stones are not completely straight, but are staggered by a few millimeters. One theory is that this is due to settling from seismic activity. Alternately, it's also proposed that the slope of the blocks was cut to shape before being placed due to the limited working space towards the top. Two entrances lead to the burial chamber, one up the northern face and the other at the base on the same axis. These passageways do not align with the center line but are offset to the east. The lower descending passageway is completely carved out of bedrock. There is a subsidiary chamber whose purpose is unknown. The burial chamber was carved out of a pit in the bedrock. The roof is constructed of gabled limestone beams. The chamber is rectangular and oriented east-west. Khafra's sarcophagus was found inside. It was carved out of a solid block of granite and sunk partially in the floor. Inside of it, Belzoni found bones of an animal, possibly a bull. Another pit in the floor likely contained the canopic chest. Its lid would have been one of the pavement slabs. There are two small rectangular holes in the walls of the burial chamber facing each other, which resembles the air shaft found in the Great Pyramid. The surrounding complex contains a satellite pyramid, two temples for Khafra's mortuary cult, and a causeway connecting them. The temples of Khafra's complex survive in much better condition than Khufu's. To the east of the pyramid sits the mortuary temple, now largely in ruins, but enough of it survives to understand its basic plan. It is larger than previous temples and is the first to include all five standard elements of later mortuary temples, an entrance hall, a columned court, five niches or statues of the pharaoh, five storage chambers, and an inner sanctuary. There were over 50 life-size statues of Khafra, but these were removed and recycled, probably by Ramses II. The causeway runs 494 meters from the mortuary temple to the valley temple which is smaller in plan and remarkably well-preserved. It is built of megalithic blocks sheathed in red granite. The square pillars of the T-shaped hallway were made of solid granite and the floor was paved in alabaster. The exterior was built of huge blocks. Though devoid of any internal decoration, this temple would have been filled with symbolism. Two doors open into a vestibule and a large pillared hall, in which there were sockets in the floor that would have fixed the aforementioned 23 statues of Khafra that we talked about when we talked about him. Khafra's pyramid was likely opened and robbed during the first intermediate period. Arab historians recorded that it was opened in 1372. On the wall of the burial chamber, there is Arabic graffiti that probably dates from the same time. The Great Sphinx of Giza is a limestone statue of a reclining creature with the head of a human and the body of a lion. Facing directly from west to east, it and its temple are very close to the causeway and valley temple of Khafra, Khufu's son. The face appears to resent Khafra himself. The original shape was cut from the bedrock, and it has since been restored with layers of limestone blocks. It measures 73 meters long from paw to tail, 20 meters high from the base to the top of the head, and 90 meters wide at its rear haunches. 
It is the oldest known monumental sculpture in Egypt and one of the most recognizable statues in the world. Its original name is unknown. A thousand years later in the New Kingdom, the statue was revered as the solar deity Horam Akhet, which means Horus of the Horizon. The commonly used name Sphinx was given to it about 2,000 years after it was constructed. This name is a reference to a Greek mythological beast with the head of a woman and the body of a lion and the wings of an eagle. Even though this statue has a man's head and no wings. Historian Susan Wise Bauer suggests that the word Sphinx was a Greek corruption of the Egyptian name Shesapank, which meant living image, and referred to the statue of the Sphinx carved out of the living bedrock that was part of the earth, not cut away from its original source. The archaeological evidence suggests that it was created during the 4th dynasty, probably during the reign of Khafra. This evidence comes not from inscriptions, but the stratigraphic sequence of the landscape and other structures around it. In order to construct the Sphinx Temple, the northern perimeter wall of the Khafra Valley Temple had to be deconstructed, indicating that the Khafra funerary complex was built before the Sphinx and its temple. The angle and location of the south wall of the Sphinx enclosure suggests the causeway connecting Khafra's pyramid and valley temples already existed before the Sphinx. The lower base level of the Sphinx temple also indicates that it does not predate the valley temple. The statue itself was not built, but carved from the bedrock of the plateau, which also served as the quarry for the pyramids and other monuments in the area. It's been suggested that the head may have been carved first from a natural ridge of bedrock that had been sculpted by the wind. The pneumolithic limestone of the area consists of layers which offer differing resistance to erosion forces of wind and sand, leading to the uneven degradation apparent in the Sphinx's body. The lowest part of the body, including the legs, is solid rock. The body of the animal up to its neck is fashioned from softer layers that have suffered from considerable erosion. The layer in which the head was sculpted is much harder. It's thought that after the making the head, the moat around the Sphinx was quarried out to create its body. Residues of red pigment are visible on the face, and traces of yellow and blue pigment have also been found elsewhere, suggesting that the monument was once decked out in gaudy colors. The stones cut from around its body were used to construct a temple in front of it. However, neither the enclosure nor the temple were ever completed, and the relative scarcity of Old Kingdom cultural material suggests that a sphinx cult was not established at the time in which it was originally carved. The dating and assignment of Khafra as its builder has been challenged. Other scholars suggest that the statue was made during the reigns of Khufu or Djedfra. Geologist Colin Reeder has also suggested a late pre-dynastic or early dynastic origin for it, when Egyptians were already known to be capable of sophisticated masonry. He argues that hydrological changes due to quarrying activity for the pyramids caused water runoff on the plateau, which created the varying stages of erosion on the walls of the enclosure, meaning the Sphinx predated the quarries and thus the pyramids. But it's key to remember that in this theory, he doesn't think that it's earlier by thousands of years, more likely potentially a few centuries. In the first intermediate period, Giza was abandoned, and drifting sand eventually buried the Sphinx up to its shoulders. The first documented attempt at excavating it dates to the 1400 BCE, when the young prince, who eventually became King Cutmos IV, gathered a team and managed to dig out the front paws, between which he erected a shrine that housed the dream stele, an inscribed granite slab describing a dream he had while sleeping in the shadow of the statue. When the stele was discovered in 1818, its line of texts were damaged and incomplete. It associates the Sphinx with Khafra. However, this part of the text was not entirely intact. At the time, Egyptologist Thomas Young, finding the Khaf hieroglyph in a damaged cartouche used to surround a royal name, inserted the glyph Ra to complete Khafra's name. When the stele was re-excavated in 1925, the lines of text referring to Khaf flaked off and were destroyed, so Young's hypothesis can't really be verified. Also found in 1818 were fragments of a 
ceremonial pharaonic beard thought to have also been added by Tutmos IV. The new beard had a curved tip, which identified the wearer as a god. The main parts of it can be seen in the British Museum, while other portions are now in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Many New Kingdom stelae depict the Sphinx wearing a crown. If it existed, a hole found on the top of the head that was closed off in 1926 could have been the anchoring point for the crown. In Greco-Roman times, Giza became a tourist destination and Roman emperors visited it. In the first century CE, it was cleared of sand in honor of Emperor Nero. Pliny the Elder describes the face as being colored red and measured it. A monumental 12 meter wide stairway was erected leading to a pavement in front of the paws. At the top of the stairs, a podium was positioned that allowed a view into the Sphinx sanctuary. This stairway was dismantled during excavations in 1931-2. The cult of the Sphinx continued into medieval times. Arab authors described it as a talisman that guarded the area from the desert and or influenced the flood cycle of the Nile. One author stated that those wishing to obtain bureaucratic positions in the Egyptian government gave incense offerings to the monument. The body of the statue has not survived completely intact. Several holes, fissures, shafts, and passages have been found, several of which are most likely dug by treasure hunters and tomb robbers. Take, for example, the rump passage at the rear. In 1926, an opening to a tunnel at floor level on the north side of the rump was found, but then closed by masonry and nearly forgotten. Years later, the passage's existence was recalled by three elderly men who had worked on the clearing project in 1926. This led to the rediscovery and excavation of the passage in 1980. It consists of an upper and lower section angled roughly 90 degrees to one another, terminating in a cul-de-sac pit at groundwater level. The bottom contained modern fill, including tinfoil, modern cement, and a pair of shoes. Based on an 1837 diary entry by Howard Weiss, noting that he was boring near the tail, it is thought that he created the passage, as no other tunnel has been identified at this location. Another interpretation is that the shaft is of ancient origin, perhaps an exploratory tunnel or an unfinished tomb shaft. The Sphinx has also attracted its fair share of several pseudo-archaeological claims including that there is a great hall of records containing knowledge of Atlantis underneath the statue. Graham Hancock thinks that it was built in 10,500 BCE, claiming that instead of facing the rising sun, a popular theme in Egyptian mythology, it is actually aligned to face the constellation of Leo during the vernal equinox that would have happened at that time in history uh, in 10,500 BCE. None of these claims are supported by archaeological, climatological, or geological evidence. At some point, long rods or chisels were hammered into the nose area to pry the nose off towards the south, resulting in the one meter wide nose still being lost to date. Many folk tales exist regarding the destruction of the Sphinx's nose. One erroneously attributes it to cannonballs fired by the army of Napoleon, perhaps inspiring the recent film, which showed him firing on the pyramids. Um, but it is considered false, since drawings of the Sphinx from around 1737 already show the nose as missing. The damaged nose has also been mentioned by 10th century Arab authors, stating that it was the result of iconoclastic attacks. Over the centuries, writers and scholars have recorded their impressions and reactions upon see seeing the Sphinx. In the 1560s, it was recorded that a priest went into the head, and when he spoke, it was as if the Sphinx itself was speaking. In 1857, August Mariette unearthed the much later inventory stela from the 26th dynasty, which tells how Khufu came upon the Sphinx already buried in sand. Although parts of the stela's text are likely accurate, this passage contradicts the archaeological evidence, and it is now considered to be late period historical revisionism a purposeful fake created by local priests as an attempt to imbue the contemporary Isis temple with an ancient history it never had. Such acts became common when religious institutions were fighting for political attention and financial and economic do donations. In 1931, engineers of the Egyptian government repaired the head as a part of its headdress had fallen off in 1926 due to erosion. 
This questionable repair added a concrete collar between the headdress and the neck, creating an altered profile. Many renovations to the stone base and raw rock body were done in the 1980s and then redone in the 1990s. Mankara's pyramid is the last and smallest to be built at Giza. Its name was Netjeri Mankara. Okay, sorry, it ran over a little bit there, and uh, I was getting distracted by uh, me building a fake causeway uh, to kind of imitate the original causeways that would have led from the valley temples to the pyramid. So this uh, uh, Khafre's pyramid doesn't have a um, temple or a causeway that is attached to it like the Great Pyramid does, which you actually see here. This is a causeway. I don't know if the causeway would have actually been covered or not, but um, this is clearly meant to be the valley temple. And then this is the um, pyramid temple. Um, but yeah, we don't have that option uh in the game uh for these smaller pyramids so i'm faking it whoop-de-woo um <laughs> hi mitch uh that's okay no problem if you're late uh you're here for the very end which is you you made it even if you're late so that's all that really matters um so yeah let's just make a kind of finish prettying up my thing as we can see um i have actually completed the game because I completed all this stuff but I want to just finish this bit before we move on um, so I'm just continuing to govern so instead of uh, temples I've just put statues at either end because if I did put temples there I'd have to put in um, architects posts and fire things I'm also just putting these these are defensive walls um, but these are uh, going to represent for me here the enclosure walls that uh, actually enclose the, the pyramids themselves. Um, before we just started this tangent, um, Vavarka was asking about animal mummies. So um, in terms of animal mummies, um, there had a, a few different kind of purposes. Um, the in some ways like the animals were you know some of them were pets there's at least uh like the oldest known like kind of pet cat burial is um a burial of a prince's cat and um her name is uh ned gem uh, which it's on her sarcophagus like we know the name of this cat um and it that means sweetie in ancient egyptian and I almost named my cat Ned Gem because I really thought that that would be cool. But um, Emma, I think, suits her just as well. Um, yeah, so if we were in real life, the Sphinx would be basically next to this causeway. But yeah, it's not proportional. So, but it's, cl it's close enough. I have it too close to Khufu's Pyramid, but that's just how it's going to be. Actually, I could redo it. Nah, I'm not going to. That's fine. I put it too close. Um, that's fine. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, and sometimes they were offerings. Um, you know, this, the cat goddess Bast, Bastet, she had, you know, her temples certainly had quite a high population of, um, I would guess, feral um, or like high pot, like lots of cat colonies around there. And the cats would be sacrificed sometimes to the gods. Like Egyptians didn't do lots of sacrificing people outside of um, burying retainers in some earlier periods, but they did lots of animal sacrifices. So they would sacrifice bulls, they um, would sacrifice cats, um, other animals as well. Um, also, they had this whole cult, uh, like bulls in particular, were revered, and there were certain holy bulls uh, that resided at temples um, in the cities uh, that represented some of these gods. So, for example, the most famous one is the Apis bull. Um, I think it was in, that was outside of Ab Abydos. But those bulls wouldn't necessarily, I don't think, been sacrificed, but they obviously would die. And then they would get buried in due pomp and ceremony with mummification, etc. So I hope that's answered your question, Viverka. 
um, let me know if you have any follow-ups. Yeah, the flood's not going to be great. Nobody's surprised. I can't farm things anyway. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to just... Um, we don't really have much left to play on here, but I'm going to finish talking about the Pyramid of Menkaura. Um, actually, you know what? I'm moving the Sphinx. Yeah, baboons were um, like highly desired uh, because they're s A, they're smart. Um, but uh, yeah, they... Uh, oh, I can't... Okay, no, I can't remake the Sphinx because the stone masons. Or maybe if I can I get rid of it, and then okay, yeah, okay. Stone masons guild. Let's just do a few of those, and then I'll do carpenters guild, and then we'll import some wood, and I'll rebuild the Sphinx closer just because I'm being pedantic really do I need to do this no um, but I'm just doing it for my own sake really right so we'll have this right next to that and we'll have we'll make uh, a nice little road there gardens actually this follows the chronological age much better because the sphinx was most likely built after Khafre's pyramid was finished so this is yeah if I was trying to do things in the right way and not in trying to complete the game before the stream's done I would have done it in this order great pyramid Khafre pyramid and then the sphinx itself but uh oh I'll take away these gardens I don't know where the access is. Uh, yeah, so I have importing wood and I've got access for wood, so I just need the carpenters to get it together. <clears throat> Alrighty. Um, all right, well, while we finish the Sphinx for the second time, um, what? Oh, did I get rid of the architect's post? Whoops. Put the dock back in. Um, yes, okay, while we finish the Sphinx for the second time, I will play my last sequence for today, which is Mankau Rose Pier. which means Mankaura is divine. It had an original height of 65.5 meters, but now stands at 61 meters tall with a base of 108.5 meters. Its angle of incline is approximately 51 degrees, and it was constructed of limestone and Aswan granite. The first 16 courses of the exterior were made of red granite. The upper portion was cased in Tura limestone. Menkaura's pyramid chambers are more complex than those of Khafra and include a chamber carved with decorative panels and another chamber with six large niches. The burial chamber is lined with massive granite blocks. At the entrance, an inscription thought to be the work of Kam Waset, son of Ramses II, says that Menkaura was the builder of the pyramid and that he died on the 23rd day. Oops. Should have done more than uh, two years of governing. That's fine. Um, I'm going to just leave this here and then we'll finish this segment and then we'll have a chat. Of the third month of the harvest season. In 1837, in the upper antechamber, the remains of a wooden anthropoid coffin inscribed with Menkaura's name and containing human bones was found. However, this is now considered to be a substitute coffin from the late period, as radiocarbon dating on the bones found that they were less than 2,000 years old, suggesting an, uh, either an all-too-common bungled handling of remains from another site or access to the pyramid during Roman times. The lid from the coffin mentioned was successfully transported to England and can be seen today at the British Museum. The burial chamber is oriented north to south and clad in pink granite. It has a gabled ceiling, which has been 
cut to create a barrel vault. Inside, a beautiful black basalt sarcophagus was found, rich in detail, with a bold projecting cornice, but containing the bones of a young woman, not Menkara. Unfortunately, this sarcophagus now lies at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, having sunk in 1838 with the ship Beatrice as she made her way between Malta and Cartagena on the way to Great Britain. This is extra unfortunate as it was one of only a handful of Old Kingdom sarcophagi to have survived into the modern period. Mancaro's mortuary complex consisted of the usual pyramid temple, valley temple, causeway, and three smaller pyramids. In the pyramid temple, the foundations and inner core were made of limestone. The floors were begun with granite and granite facings were added to some of the walls. The foundations of the valley temple were also made of stone, but both temples were finished with crude bricks. The valley temple is where a large number of statues, mostly of Menkaura alone, but also as a member of a group were found. South of the main pyramid are three smaller ones, each with its own temple and substructure. The easternmost is the largest and a true pyramid. Its casing is partially of granite and it's believed to have been com completed, but neither of the other two progressed beyond construction of the inner core. It's been speculated that the structures were likely tombs of four queens of Menkaura, who have may also been his half-sisters. Others argue that one of these pyramids has a layout akin to a Ka pyramid, which would have housed a statue of the king rather than a body. The fact that the structure once contained a pink granite sarcophagus, however, has led scholars to speculate that it may have been reused as a queen's burial, tomb, or that it served as a chapel where the body of Menkaura was mummified. As mentioned before, in 1196 CE, Al-Aziz Uthman, Saladin's son and Sultan of Egypt, attempted to demolish the pyramids, starting with Menkaura's. Workmen spent eight months trying to accomplish this, but found it was almost as expensive to destroy as it was to build. They could only remove one or two stones each day. Some used wedges and levers to move the stones, while others used ropes to pull them down. When a stone fell, it would bury itself in the sand, requiring extra effort to free it. Wedges were used to split the stones into several pieces, and a cart was used to carry it to the foot of the escarpment where it was left. Despite their efforts, workmen were only able to damage the pyramid to the extent of leaving a large vertical gash at its northern face before they gave up. Okay, that's the, uh, the end of the segments for today. Um, so yeah, and the, the mission is done. We're like 10 minutes ahead of schedule guys. Like what's going on here? I don't normally do this well. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't really know what else to say. Is there, do you guys have any comments in the chat? How did you find the segments today? What part did you enjoy uh, learning about the most and or what is something new that you learned that you didn't know before? Um, the my favorite thing that I think that I learned about this were as I said the legends of the the Menkaura stuff um but also I don't know I just enjoyed learning about them and, and looking at them in in sequence like all together you can kind of really see I don't know the similarities and the differences between them um and also I think it's really important to think of and learn about them like as a whole as a complex like I was saying uh, before, they're not standalone structures. They are part of like a, a wider landscape or a wider like architectural landscape around them. And that is something that when people talk about them being built by aliens, completely ignore the entire context of everything and they just focus on the pyramid itself. They don't look at any of the evidence around it. They ignore like the worker ceremonies. They ignore the, um, the inscriptions in those worker things that talk about the gangs that did it they ignore the graffiti inside with the names of these gangs that built them um they ignore all the uh history uh of you know later documents and people visiting it people who all knew that these were tombs um as well <laughs> so 
Yeah, which I, I, it's just really interesting how they, you know, they, they, they cherry pick the bits that they want to talk about and then they ignore a lot of the times the rest of the evidence. I'm sorry if you can hear that weird mechanical noise. That's my boiler. Uh, hopefully it's going to get fixed on Wednesday. <laughs> my, um, I'm really annoyed because we were supposed to, we, it was being weird before we left for Canada and we had somebody come in to look at it while we were gone, um, like paid for by our landlord. Um, but, uh, apparently that person came in to look at it, figured out something was wrong, but didn't have the parts to fix it. So they just left it um, and it started, it had a leak basically. Um, but then didn't email us to say, by the way, I need to come back and, and like, we this needs to be rescheduled. So then we, um, on Christmas day, we got a message from our cat sitter cause we left our cat at home and had people checking in on her, uh, that the, the heating just turned off in our flat <laughs> and she didn't know how to, how to get it back on. And to be fair, that's not really her job. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was really, really stressful because obviously I want the cat to be like the cat is fine she has a fur coat and you know she's from Russia she's Russian blue um but it and the cat sitter would just like you know make sure she found an electric heater and she brought that with her and like that's all fine but yesterday someone was supposed to come out and fix it this is just me venting now um <laughs> someone was supposed to come out and fix our boiler and from between one and five o'clock the cat sitter came for that time and it turns out that the technician had shown up early without telling anyone at, at like an hour before they were supposed to show up and then they just left and then we were calling them like all day to be like where's the technician when are we in the queue and everyone was oh someone will be there before five uh, so because of the holidays and everything that means that we now can't get somebody in to fix it until the third so please keep your fingers crossed for me that my boiler lasts until then and doesn't develop any other problems because I mean I wouldn't mind if it had to get replaced it's quite old but I really don't want to have to go without hot water or heating because it's actually colder right now in Scotland than it is in Canada which is kind of crazy um but yeah that's my story of my some some of my Christmas stress um I, I don't know about you guys but I didn't I wanted to kind of have my two weeks off from my channel over the Christmas break to kind of recharge um but I didn't really get a chance to <laughs> so now I've come home and I feel a bit like oh, I've got a lot to to do but um that should be fine hopefully I'll get a break sometime soon we'll see I might have to start doing the streams once a month instead of every two weeks because producing them now basically takes up the extent of another video but I haven't quite decided on that I'll at least be doing two for a little while um Viverka thanks for saying that I'm glad that it made your day um I'm hoping it's worthwhile that uh you know I've I've put this all together while I'm still jet lagged and it was still coherent and easy for everyone to understand and that you all had a good time um, you know, I just like to come and play and then have you guys give me your feedback and it's just, it's just a nice way to spend some time with some people on the holidays. Um, yeah. Oh, and look, I'm just going to give us a brief preview. We have a choice again for our next, um, level between the Jeddu Abusir worshipping Ra and Baharia Oasis soldiers of Ra so that's going to be the war focus level and then this is the building focus level um I'm actually I know I usually give you guys a choice um sorry my boiler just popped um I know I usually give you guys a choice of which one we're going to play but I think I'm just going to pick it in advance for next time actually let me know in the chat which one you want to play next time we'll just do it now and then i'll prepare it because as it is i have to prepare two segments for two different sites which obviously takes me extra time so if i can shave any of that off i would really like to 
So we will, I'm going to put a poll. Uh, should we play next time? Uh, did you do or Baharia Oasis? Um, I'm going to put that in the chat. So put your votes in and then I will decide we will decide which one we're going to play next time and then I can prepare in advance, which I'm going to just start doing because I, yeah, I need to try and save some time, claw back a little bit of time somewhere. Um, yes. Also, if you feel like it, let me know what you guys are doing for New Year's. Um, I was supposed to go to a Kaylee, which is like Scottish line dancing I guess it's really it's funner than it sounds um, but I think my husband and I are tired enough that we might have to cancel and just have a chill New Year's at home because we're both uh, in the Scottish braid we're both to use the Scottish braid knackered and or shattered I feel like shattered is one of my favorite Scottish words because it really encapsulates how I feel right now <laughs> uh, Is anybody else dealing with jet lag? Let me know because yeah, it's my um, life hack for a cold fuck. Put up a tent. Yeah, well, my other thing that I do, well, that I will be doing tomorrow is laundry. So I actually have a tumble dryer, which is a rare thing, I think, in a lot of flats in the UK. And it's in this office. And uh, when we run it, it basically can heat this whole room up to 21 degrees. And so I will be doing that tomorrow. <laughs> be doing a bunch of laundry tomorrow and using it to help heat my flat back up to a decent temperature. Um, because it was pretty, it was, it was like probably about between around about 12 degrees uh, Celsius in the flat when we got home um, this morning, which is much colder than I would, I think anyone would ever like it to be. So uh, yeah. Right, Dejedu is winning. I'm pretty sure that if we do this, we will um, be building a sun temple to Ra. Let me just check. Dejedu, which will involve sandstone and a new type of building project. Um, Dejedu. Uh, what is the big export? I can see the mission briefings if I look at the wiki. Yeah, so our next, so next time, if we do end up doing Jejedu, we'll be doing Lady Kentakawis, who is actually has some stuff at Giza, so I'll talk about that, uh, who has been given birth to a pharaoh or king named Usarkov, uh, who begins the fifth dynasty. Um, Sun Kingdom, yeah, Sun Temples dot the landscape, and we're gonna have to build one at Jejedu. So this again, raw. So we'll talk a little bit next time about Usarkov in the fifth dynasty, his mother Kentakawes, and then these Sun Temples for raw. And maybe I'll do a little bit about, uh, I'll do a little segment for you guys on Ra himself, the the god, because obviously again, it's one of those things where like I know so much about him, I don't realize how much people don't know. Um, <laughs> so yeah, a bit of confirmation bias going on there. Anyway, it's 1859. My premiere of my next video is about to start. So I'm going to end the stream now. Uh, you, if you stay on, you'll get redirected straight to the premiere of my next video. I'll be in the live chat. We can talk about the video if you feel like watching it. Like I said, it's just a bit about the channel going forward. So it's not specifically archeology span focused. If you don't want to watch it, I understand. Um, thank you so much guys for coming along today to, for taking two and a half hours of your day to sit and listen to me ramble coherently and semi incoherently about ancient Egypt, the Great Pyramid, and you know, joining me for this last stream of the year. I look forward to seeing you all here um, next year, basically. 
So yeah, I hope that you all have a happy New Year's and that 2024 gets off to an excellent start for all of you. Thank you so much for watching. And if you can give me a like or a subscribe before you go, or even a comment in or anything, that's really very much appreciated. All right, bye. See you in the chat.